Meg, welcome to the Roadman Cycling Podcast. Oh, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Meg, you're nursing a little bit of a throat infection slash pneumonia. So thanks for braving it and sucking it up for the podcast. Well, yeah, I'd say, like I said, I, um, we've been playing phone tag, email tag for a while and I've uh, really admired your work. I feel very lucky to get on your schedule. Thank you. How did you get the sort of Macy Gray deep throat uh, accent going on there? Oh, so I, I live in Missoula, Montana. And for those of you that aren't familiar, this is uh, in the Rocky Mountains and we still have snow on the ground. Uh, the roads are starting to clear and I did a nice 50 mile ride on Saturday and then I'm just guessing I don't know I touched a door handle that I shouldn't have and didn't walk <laughs> I don't I don't know um, I work in healthcare when I'm not on the bike so I feel like I'm pretty diligent about washing my hands and keeping myself well did you lick any bus stops uh, I try not to lick any windows um, I try <laughs> um, who knows <clears throat> pardon me but uh uh, I'm feeling like maybe I need to go to Las Vegas while I've got this husky voice and see if I can't get into the lounges and uh, get a singing gig while I've got this extra uh, texture to my voice. Tyler Hamilton's from out your part of the world as well, or at least he's living there at the moment, I believe. Oh, sure is. Um, he actually was quite a, a big help to me in 2016, getting up, leading up to the, the Rio Paralympic Games. He kindly rode with me, um, gave me a lot of, you know, mentorship is a really solid guy such a nice guy i've had tyler on the podcast so many times i've had him on three four times and i've been oh, on yes. his podcast a couple of times and he actually just reached back out to me asking would myself and my girlfriend who co-hosts the friday podcast would we both come on the podcast so we're going to do that again soon oh i love his adventure audio podcast it's so much fun yes yeah he does a great job um i i really can't speak highly enough of tyler um when we might get into this but since we're talking about tyler so in uh 2002, when I was injured and I was in the hospital, that's when I first started watching the Tour de France. And I got to watch Tyler have that epic breakaway win with that broken collarbone. And um, CSC, I think he was with that year. Yeah. 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 So 14 years later in 2016, we meet at a coffee shop to ride and he rocks up on that bike and, you know, you get a little nerdy. I was stoked. It was just like he one, here's Tyler Hamilton riding with me. And then here he is on the bike that I watched him do that amazing ride. And it was, it was full circle, full circle. Yeah. Yeah. He is exactly, he's, he's not exactly what you think of. I guess when you think of top level athletes uh, from that era and he's still incredibly fit and strong, you might not expect them to be so humble and kind and generous. Um, yeah, I, he's, he's legit. Meg, I absolutely love the movie Fight Club. I, I don't know why I became so obsessed with it through university and I used to just watch it like time after time and it's been so formative for me in so many ways like some of the expressions on it I've they've been guiding lights for me nearly in some respects like when I walked away from working in law I was really had a moment where I could see where my senior colleagues were moving and they were really obsessed with things like cars and watches and there was a line from the movie things we own end up owning us uh, so that was like so impactful for me at the time but one of the early scenes in Fight Club it's the idea of starting a story at the point of high drama and that's what I want to do with this podcast Tyler Durden who's the main character and he's on his knees and he has a gun in his mouth at the very opening scene and you start the movie and you're like oh my god he's a gun in his mouth and he says something along the lines of it's hard to speak in anything other than vowels when you have a gun in your mouth and I was just hooked on the movie straight away but with that sort of principle and philosophy in mind do you mind if we start at the point of high drama in your story can you take us back to to the moment of the accident. Oh, so the accident. So we're ta I'm taking you back to June 30th, 2002. We'll set the scene. Um, my girlfriend at the time, we were driving from Chicago, Illinois, near the Great Lakes to Missoula, Montana. It's the middle of the summer. It's hot. It's dry. And that's all I remember. So I, I don't have a great, um, you know, vowels, you know, a sentence or something like that because I was too busy dying. I don't remember. Um, was it a road trip or a college yeah, trip? Yeah, good. Or sorry. Thank you for, yeah. So my um, my partner and I, we decided we wanted to move to Missoula, Montana. She was going to start a graduate school program at the University of Montana to be an English teacher. And I was going to start my sophomore year of university where I was studying to be a wildlife biology <laughs> nice, um, nice biologist and I was playing tennis at the University of Montana so I, so I was I was dating somebody a few years older than me so she obviously she was in grad school and I was um just a lowly sophomore and we both lived in Chicago <laughs> where we where we taught we taught tennis I was a um just a lifelong tennis athlete I, I picked this picked up the racket when I was three um it's been like it just it feels very natural in my hand now 
Um, so in the middle of the day, we had stopped at the Corn Palace. This is an iconic place in South Dakota. If you've, <laughs> I mean, it's a building made of corn stalks and they redesign it every year. It's, it's a perfect tourist trap. We had uh, stopped to admire the, tu- uh, the tourist trap, the Corn Palace, and we'd gone for breakfast where we had pancakes and waffles. And that's pretty much the last thing I remember. We were riding along in our car, as you do, you know, listening to music, windows down, admiring just how perfect it was. I mean, think back, I I was 19 at the time. My partner was 25. So think back to where you were at those ages, you know, nothing really hurts. You're you're baby. Yeah. yeah, Everything's an opportunity. Um, you know, I was getting to play tennis and at university we were, I was on a road trip with my girlfriend. And so 20 years ago, I wouldn't have called her my girlfriend. I mean, she was, I just, we were very, very much hidden. We wanted to hide ourselves. Nobody knew who we were to each other beyond just best friends. And she, she's, why, why was that? Oh, her parents were quite conservative. My family's quite conservative. We didn't feel like we'd be accepted. Um, we wanted to, we just, we didn't feel, I don't want to overuse this word or use it incorrectly, but we didn't feel safe. Like we felt very insecure. Um, being gay 20 years ago is was scary. Being gay 40 years ago, I think was scarier. Um, being gay today is, uh, uh, I'm sure it's still very scary for folks to come out. Um, I know it is. That said, there's a lot more cultural inclusivity and openness and queer advocacy. And that's not something that existed 20 years ago. Um, so the car rides and you two get to spend that quality time together, yeah. windows down, music blare, and that was yeah. very much your safe space. Oh yeah. And our car was full of all of our stuff. We were going to move into our first apartment together. Um, we were in between tennis sessions. So we had a summer, like a early tennis season and then, uh, and then a later one. And so we were going to sneak in the middle. We were going to just drive out to Montana, sign a lease on our apartment and then drive back, teach another session of tennis. And then that fall return to Montana, you know, begin our life together. We'd also, I mean, you, our apartment was a two bedroom apartment because we didn't want people to know that we were, you know, together. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like, we look back and, um, or I look back and it's just, it's like, it's silly. Like there's a picture of us that morning, the last picture of us together. And I remember being nervous, putting my arm around her because there was going to be proof that we were like, you know, it was, I standing too close to her. Um, if my hand was like in a fist or was it open and I was cupping her, like, you know, you put your arm around your buddy, you you know, you put your person you love, you, you hold their hip or something like that. I'm not trying to get like, <laughs> it's just like those really subtle things. Like we were sharing a tent together the night before. And I was like, Oh, are people going to worry about two girls? Like sharing a tent together. Like I was really nervous and I didn't need to be, but I was, and I look back at all that time when I was with this person I cared about so deeply. And I just wish that I didn't have that shadow or that you know, memory of also being afraid to love the person I did. But I don't think that's on you, Egg. I think most of that is the cultural backdrop of the acceptance of society at the time. Like I've, my cousin is openly gay and he's living in Canada and he went to visit another cousin of mine in Ukraine a few years ago before the war. My cousin works out there in a charity organization and it was Pride Day. And I remember my older cousin saying to him, you know, as culturally accepted as it is to be gay now in Toronto and how Pride Day is celebrated, He's like, it's not the same here in Ukraine. And you could see if a kid was grown up in Ukraine, how difficult it would be. Like when they recounted the tales of Pride Day in Ukraine, it was a day filled with violence, hostility, oppression, aggression. And that's something I can imagine that wasn't quite maybe the US 20 years ago, but it definitely wasn't what the US is today. So guilt, I don't know if it's if it's yours. I think it's more society's guilt. Yeah, you hit me in the feels there. Um, yeah. Who was driving that day? It's okay. Take a second if you need to make it. Um, so that morning, um, she started out driving. We were going to stop at lunch and switch. We saw a sign for this town called Murdo. What a name. Um, M-U-R-D-O, Murdo. I had actually been there before as I'd been driving, you know, previously from Chicago to Montana. And I knew they had a good fried chicken spot. So I, I thought we, we'll stop there, have some fried chicken, and we'll, we'll, swap, we'll switch drivers. Saw a sign that said Murdo was eight miles away. 
we never got to Murdo. I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, there are some witnesses to the accident who say that like uh, maybe we drifted and hit the rumble strip, you know, the kind of textured strip on the side of the road. Maybe she overcorrected and we were driving a small SUV at the time. And maybe, who knows? I don't really know, but we, we caught, um, we, we fit kind of swerving and, and caught a wheel or something like that and flipped over and landed on the roof and we almost did almost a full circle but really we landed on her side and so uh the roof collapsed and uh injured sarah very badly uh we rolled eight and a half times we just tumbled um so it's quite a bit of energy in that accident quite a bit of force um, I don't remember any of it. Very, I, 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 I have no recollection of any of it. Uh, my body kind of remembers it because, like, you know, if I'm in a car and it swerves, I kind of get a little spooked. But I don't remember the accident at all. Um, I hit my head very, very badly. Well, did you have that? Like, what was your first memory of coming to? And how how, how long after the accident was that first memory? Um. So my first memory was. Probably two, a little over two weeks later, because I spent some time in a coma. I had some tubes oh my down gosh. my throat. They did some brain surgery because um, my brain was swelling and bleeding. Um, they did some other surgeries because I had my left foot ripped off during that accident. Like clean, just got, completely off? Uh, sort of. Um, and I'm not, if you're squeamish, I won't go into too much detail, but I basically got my part of my, most of my foot ripped off. Um and then they didn't like where they weren't able to finish like cleaning up my leg. They were worried, you know, is she going to live? You know, those details. Um, and so uh I remember waking up in the ICU. I do remember like seeing I thought I th- I thought I saw Sarah. Um and she said, like, I'll always be with you. And then she walked away. And and you know. Could that have been my nurse? Maybe. Um, but I just remember her being at the foot of my bed. And that's kind of one of my first memories. Probably my second memory is looking down. And um, next time you, you lay in bed, just look down at your feet. You'll see that there's like actually two foot bumps. You, know, you don't even notice it. But like I looked down and I only had one foot bump. And I was like, oh, that's not good. Like we're... <laughs> You know, I remember thinking like, well, where did it go? Um, what's nice about waking up from a coma, it's not like in the movies where it's like the lights are on and all of a sudden you're awake. It's more like a really bad strobe light dance party where like it just kind of flashes on and then it's off and then it's on. You're awake for a second and then you're not there. And so it's just this kind of my Woosh is hands down the best virtual cycling app for home and it's redefining indoor training at no cost. Yep, it's absolutely free. And setting up My Woosh is really easy. Just download the My Woosh app, connect your device like your Watt bike or your smart trainer and off you go. Now, if you're feeling competitive, there's weekly races for every category from beginner to pro Plus, there's insane prize money up for grabs. Now, if you've no plan to race, that's no problem. There's hundreds of free training plans and workouts that are designed to really push you to your limits. You can enjoy daily group rides and group workouts, and you can customize your avatar all without opening your wallet. So go on over to the MyWish app and have a look around. Why spend money on monthly subscriptions elsewhere when MyWish offers all of this for free? So join MyWish today. It's available on iOS, Mac OS, Google Play, Apple TV, or click on the link in the show notes to get started. Gradual realization, like I think it's a very nice thing that our body does, or maybe it's medicine, who knows, but you wake up and you kind of look around and you go, what is going on? And before you really get overwhelmed with the magnitude of, I have no idea what's going on, you're out. 
And so and gradually, is there the consciousness piece... like is there like do you have memories from that time? Is it like being in a long dream, or you know, is there any way to like mm. gauge? You know, if you go into you know, sometimes you fall asleep for a nap, and you might fall asleep for fifteen minutes, and then you wake up and you check the clock, and you're like, oh my god, I, I have no idea as you yeah. check that clock, if this is going to be 15 minutes or if this is going to be nine hours I fell asleep for. Like, do you have an awareness of time or can you None. describe what it's like? No, no sense of time. I, ha- I had no idea how much time I lost. No concept of time. Um, yeah, I think the closest I've got to is like walking into a party where there's a strobe light and you just like, you walk in and the lights are on and off and you're just trying to like, well, where is everything in the party? Where is the dance floor? Where are my friends? Where is the bar? Um, that said, like, I don't drink alcohol, but I do know what a party feels like. But it's like you walk in and you don't, you're really disoriented. You're like, oh man, I, I know I came here with somebody. Where'd they go? So that I remember thinking, where's Sarah? So, you know, I came into this scene and it just, it just keeps clicking on and off. I have a really good friend and I wrote on the front of the tandem, actually, we'll get into that. I wrote on the front of the tandem in the Para World Championships for him, Peter Ryan, and he's visually impaired. And Peter's story is amazing, but he was a high level athlete in another Irish sport where you're basically a celebrity in Ireland if you play this sport where he's from. And he was starting to make is some mistakes hurling? in training. Hurling, it is indeed. Ha <laughs> So hurling and it's Tipperary. So it's the part of the country that's like, it's like being a good soccer player in Brazil. If you're yes. a good hurling player in Tipperary, it's like you're golden. As yes. He describes it. He's like, you're having sex every night of the week with a different person. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like you're just a beaver in Tipperary if you play hurling. But he was making some mistakes in training and he asked his mom to bring him to get contact lenses. And they done a little test on him when he was getting his contact lenses. They're so like, we need to refer you to Dublin to an eye specialist before we can give you the contact lenses. He got a battery of tests done in Dublin. And then he recalls in vivid detail this moment where the doctor came out and he sat him and his parents down. And I'm not going to do justice to the exact condition he had, but it's Lieber's Hereda Neuropathy, I think it's called. But long and short of it is, they said to him, look, you, you're going to be totally blind inside six weeks. Your eyesight's gone. And that moment and the gravity of that moment, his both his parents broke down, started bawling, crying. And he said he just made the decision going, look, someone needs to be strong and that's going to be me. And so I'm just going to bottle this emotion. I'm going to keep the stiff upper lip and I'm going to just say, you know, thanks doctor. And I'm going to keep moving on with my life. And his story gets fascinating and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. I'm sure in parts through the rest of this conversation, but he goes through a spirals of depression and uh, addiction before coming out and emerging the other side as this amazing dude. But I'm always kind of curious in these hugely traumatic life events. Is there that conversation? Is there that instant when their doctor comes out to you and sits you down and says, look, here's the list of your injuries. And also, by the way, your partner has passed away. Or how do you find out this information? Is it piecemeal? Oh, it's all piecemeal. Because I think it's like I, like I wasn't conscious enough to take it all in at once. And it, as far as like that moment of like reckoning where you're like, oh gosh, because, uh, for my initial injury. So it's like, if you hold your, your hand out and you like cock your wrist back. So like your shin bone is that long bone in your arm. And then your foot would be your hand and your toes are the tips of your fingers. Basically what happened in my accident is that I got the front half of my foot ripped off. No idea. Didn't hurt because Again, I was too busy dying. Um, so I don't remember my foot getting ripped off, but I had my heel. And so the doctors initially said, well, you'll be pretty functional. So they took muscle from my stomach and skin from my thigh and patched up where my you know, fingers had been. So they just kind of cut everything off. And so basically I had what was what I had left more or less was basically like the long bones of your arm into your, you know, the palm of your hand, the heel. And then, um, so I never really thought about what the ramifications of taking half my stomach muscles would be like today. I can't do a sit up. I am a turtle <laughs> if I lay down on the ground. Okay. Like I can't, uh, and, um, I'll never have a six pack. Like my stomach caves in on half, half the side. Like it's, it's kind of funny, but it's also like, well, that kind of stinks. Um, and I had skin grafts, which actually were some of the most painful parts of it. 
Um, and initially they had to do um, bandage changes and they only found out later that I had an exposed nerve and that's why it hurt so bad. So I, lots of pain. Anyway, you, you get through those initial stages, right? You're like the, the, the magnitude of being in the hospital. You don't really recognize my life flight nurses and my pilot, his name was Dave. He was a pilot in Vietnam. He would come and visit and sit with me when they couldn't fly. Cause so he'd just come up from the helicopter bay and hang out with me. He, he told me that when he looked back in the helicopter that he didn't think I was going to make it, which kind of like you, it's like when, you know, your buddy or your, your compatriot who's a Viet, Vietnam veteran looks back and goes, oh man, you're not going to make it. You're like, oh wow. So but again, you're living like I was living in the moment. Um, it's very much like being a traveler where you don't really plan the future. You don't really plan what's for dinner. You just kind of like make it through each moment. Like you're hungry, you eat, you're tired, you sleep, you have surgery, you have, you have surgery, you're in pain, you try to fix that. Like it's this very like, I had no concept of what my life might become. And it wasn't until I got back to Chicago when they started fitting me with more prostheses. Um, so a prosthetic is adjective. So it's prosthetic arm, prosthetic leg. So prosthesis is a noun. Um, so they were fitting me with my prosthesis. And I had this belief that, um, you know, I was only missing more or less half my foot. So I figured that I'd be amazing. Like I'd be back on the tennis court. Um, I, you know, had really bounced back pretty darn well from my head injury um, and all the other injuries. I thought I, I, I had some hope for the future. And my prosthetist, those are the people who make prosthetic limbs, uh, he said, sweetheart, you'll never be as good as you were. And that was the one that still resonates in my my head. It just kind of rings around like you'll never be as good as you were. I mean, I was such weird advice, though, to give someone considering he probably knows very little about the sport of tennis, probably knows very little of your previous level, the strength of your will to get back to a level you were previously at. Like people often overshare when they're maybe not qualified to overshare like his. Yeah. His specialty was prosthetic limbs, not assessing, you know, your tennis ability and your likelihood to get back there. Well, he, I, I mean, this is pretty prolific in the healthcare world. Is I think people try to give reasonable expectations. And maybe this is as well in like every field, like, you know, going to get a haircut and you wanting to look like, choose somebody with beautiful hair. And they're like, you know, you're probably not going to have that hair. Or like you go to your financial advisor, like, I want to be Bill Gates. You're probably not going to be Bill Gates. Okay. So I think there's always some people trying to give some reasonable expectations. And and I don't, I don't hold anything against that person. They've actually turned it out to be pretty much like family. Like I'm on the group text, the family group text, like this person. Um, yes, they tried to keep my expectations reasonable. They also monumentally changed my life in a way that um, I can objectively say my life is better than it, I think it ever could have been. I don't believe in coulds and shoulds and woulds. I'm happy to get into the subjunctive tense. I think it's rubbish, but I can tell you my life is better. My life is better. My life is great. Um, and I'm grateful for the prostheses I have. I never made it back to college tennis. Like he, that, that practitioner was right. I, I could not move on the tennis court the way I did before I could not be as fast as I was. I can do a lot of other things though. So what's the limitations of your injuries at the moment or what's the kind of the shopping list of injuries that you manage on a daily basis? So my head injury is something I kind of juggle with a lot. Um, my memory is not so great. I don't have great planning. I don't really see the future very well. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, I live very much in the present. And so like, I, I don't remember appointments. I don't remember um, passwords. I mean, that's pretty common. People will be like, yeah, I don't remember passwords. I don't remember names. I don't remember faces. I can just say like, it's that and a little bit more. When I went back to college, I needed help with writing. So one of the areas that got messed up was my word finding. So when I'm tired, I, I stutter a lot more. I have a harder time with word finding. And is this all manageable? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, was I able to go back to college? Yes. Did I end up going for advanced advanced degrees? Yeah. I have a doctorate in physical therapy. Like I'm not I'm not significantly impaired, but I'm more impaired than I was. And there are times that that's better and worse. Um, the traumatic brain injuries are still something that aren't well understood. It's kind of like outer space. Everyone's is a little <laughs> experience is a little bit different. You know, um, you can't just say, "Well, I had a traumatic brain injury." Well, I had traumatic brain injury. It's kind of like 
it's so unique. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Like we're moving a little bit away from that culture of it being so alpha male to get back in the fight, get back in the game right. and not mention anything about it. But still, people view it as a little bit of a badge of weakness if you say, look, oh, yeah. I think I might have a concussion here. 100%. I mean, we talk about like volleyball players. If you get, you know, somebody spikes a ball off your head, that can cause a TBI. There's so many ways we can injure ourselves and there's so many gradations. So it's like, yes, ringing your bell is a traumatic brain injury. And they're like, what? No, I just rung my bell. Well, you did. Um, and so that's that's on the spectrum. And I think we're getting better at recognizing that there's a, a true spectrum of the human experience. There's a spectrum of injury. I, I love talking about traumatic brain injuries because it's like part of the reason I went into physical therapy. Like I love helping people, but the more I learn about how to help other people, I also learn more about myself. So it's does not complete altruism. I think traumatic brain injuries are... Uh, yeah. I remember, yeah. I bounced my head off the cobbles in Belgium and I told my coach that like I hit my head and they're like, Oh no, you're fine. Your helmet looks fine. And then when I went back, I like you know, stressed my helmet and I like cracked my helmet and they're like, no, 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 you're fine. And it's just like, no, I, I, I'm not fine. And, uh, I think everybody has a story like that where you go, if you can tell your coach, you go, if you tell somebody that you, you look to for help and they go, no, you're fine. It's hard to be an advocate for yourself. But what I'm, I'm curious about for you is, and I feel like I'm a little bit of an insight into the para world and living with a disability by virtue of being quite close friends with Peter, who I mentioned, Peter Ryan, who's Irish Paralympian, who lost his sight. An interesting internal dilemma that he has quite often is, okay, I've made a mistake or I have this limitation in my life. Is this limitation a limitation that is just a limitation, like anyone would experience a limitation, or is this limitation a limitation because of my disability? And one very interesting take, and I've told this story before on the podcast, I think. I was in a convenience store one day, and Peter bought two coffees. And he got very independent. Like for someone that's visually impaired, he doesn't use his cane. He's an amazing spatial awareness and has these tactics for moving his way around. Like my girlfriend almost doesn't believe he's blind. She's like, how is he so independent? Because he breaks all the stereotypes of what it means to be a blind guy. You know, I think about a blind guy, I think of someone, you know, bad posture, quite dependent mm -hmm. on others, you know, quite meek, where he's like stand-up comedy funny. He's a six-pack, you know, he's a, he's a professional athlete. He's an after-dinner speaker. He's an amazing advocate for disability of any sort. But we're in the convenience store and he gets his first coffee and he places it on the counter to pay for it. He gets his second coffee and he places it on top of the car machine and it spills all over the counter and you know he's quite embarrassed the shopkeeper's quite embarrassed and i was like oh i was kind of almost crawling inside myself i'm like oh like i'm embarrassed for him and what mm -hmm. do i say and so i like just didn't say anything i kind of pretend that i didn't see it and then about a half an hour later i said to him i was like you know it like how frustrating is that for you and he gave me an explanation that's kind of stood with me a lot and i go back to it in moments myself when he, he posed a question to me. He said, have you ever spilled a coffee? And I was like, yeah, of course I've spilled a coffee. He's like, well, why did you spill a coffee? And I said, because I was inattentive. And he said, that's exactly why I spilled a coffee, because I'm inattentive. Not, nothing to do with visual impairment. He's like, I have a system where I know if I'm going to put something on a flat surface, I clear it with my left hand before I place it with my right hand. He's like, I was inattentive. I didn't use my system. That's why the coffee spilled. He's like, we get to choose what we attribute our mistakes to. And that's a very long-winded way of me asking, is this something you personally battle with? Do you attribute this to your disability or do you attribute this to, you know, a meg limitation for once of a better word? So this is, this is going to be a bit of a, a long response. Um, just longer than my question. I'm going to bring it back up. I'm going to bring it up to speed in that like, so uh, I also, 11 months after I, I lost part of my foot, I ended up losing the rest of my leg. So I have a transtibial or below knee amputation on my left side. The um, What is left of my leg is about three and a half inches long. I have a really short little leg. Um, so it means I don't have a lot of... Hey, Rob, man, excuse the short interruption. I love riding the bike, but on account of being so busy with the podcast at the moment, I'm now what's called a time-crunched rider. I never thought I'd see the day. But I have a tool. I'm using what bike to keep myself sharp and on point with specific sessions to maximize that available training time. 
I have a Watt bike Adam right here in the recording studio beside me. And when I have an error in between interviews, I jump on. It's removing all the friction points for me. There's no more 10 minute setup, unfolding legs, banging my knees off stuff, getting my hands dirty, the usual connection issues. It just works every single time. The Adam's perfect for virtual racing as well because it has crisp gear changes, it has 1% accuracy, and it has max gradient capability of up to 25%. If you're looking for an indoor trainer, I honestly couldn't recommend this any higher. I've been using a Watt bike since 2013. Honestly, it's the last indoor trainer that you're ever going to need. If you head on over to wattbike.com now and use code ROADMAN10, that's R O A D M E N T E N, and that's going to get you 10% off your Watt bike. Physical power, like physics, like my lever arm isn't very long for me to control um, what would be my left ankle and left foot. Um, and so this goes into compensations. So I am, I have a physical therapy degree and I just geek out on this. I absolutely love compensations because we all compensate in various ways, whether it's for our memory, whether it's for uh, decreased range of motion somewhere or balance or decreased strength or uh, impairments in a primary sense like vision. Um, I think is what's fascinating is that to be considered legally blind, you don't have to have zero vision. You can have some vision. There's, there's a kind of a, some eye tests that, or above my pay grade, but, um, people can like, it's, I, I'm continually amazed that somebody who has a spinal cord injury often can walk. Somebody who has quadriplegia can also walk and quadriplegia means in primary and all four extremities, hands and feet. Whereas kind of a lower level spinal cord injury is somebody who has impairments in their legs. People who have stroke or hemiplegia along one side of their body or uh, cerebral palsy or something along those lines. Like there are just the number of impairments that are out there in the world is huge. And I use the word impairment versus disability because the word disability, dis means not or the opposite of. And ability means, you know, what we think that what you can do. So disability means not able. So well, is it actually incorrect to say that I am like not able to bend my ankle? Yeah, I have a, my disability is there. I prefer physical impairment because I can still do, I can still go downstairs. I can still go upstairs. Um, I, I don't identify somebody as someone with a disability. Because so it's more of a continuum where you say yeah. disability feels kind of binary. I can do this, I can't do it versus right. impairment is like, okay, I can't do it maybe as well as someone else. Sure. Yeah. So I have an impairment and I learned to compensate. So like uh, if you've been alpine skiing, that's sort of like how my left leg works. I have no ability to bend or move my ankle at all. So if you've maybe when you go for lunch at the lodge, you walk upstairs and you're like, that's not so bad. It's kind of awkward. Okay. But I did it. Right. And you get your lunch and then you're like, oh, all right, time to go skiing again. And then you're like, I'm going to walk down those stairs to go get to my skis. And you're like, holy goodness, this is awkward as I'll get out. But <laughs> how do I not fall? Maybe I have to hold on to the railing. Okay. Whew. I got down, I get back on my skis. So that's the idea. Like I can, I think I could summit Mount Everest. Could I get down from Mount Everest? I don't know. Um, walking downstairs is much like walking downstairs in ski boots. Um, and when I like running, I, I can run. Can I run as well as somebody who's got two legs? You know what? There are some people with two legs that I can mop the floor with. There are some people <laughs> who have two legs that I cannot mop the floor with. Okay. So am I disabled? Mm. Or are they disabled? Mm. No, no, we have like different compensations. I've put a lot of effort into my physical ability. And so I am better on a bike than some people with two legs or who haven't had a traumatic brain most injury. most people with two legs. That have like all of their ab muscles. Like, you know, I, I, you know, so like, does that mean that they're disabled? No, it just means that like, we all have put effort in. Like I, I, I've always been sporty. Like, my family is very sporty. I have those genetics. So somebody who maybe isn't as sporty, is it their fault? Eh, no, if they put the effort into it, maybe they can be better. Cause like the idea is like, well, what do you want to be good at? Like if you want to be an Olympian, um, can you ride your bike three hours a week? No. You can't just commute to work on your bike. That is an unreasonable expectation. If you want to be a, a world champion hurdler, you've got to put quite a bit of time, effort, and you know resources, sacrifice into it. And maybe you, 
maybe, maybe won't be a world champion temporary hurler. But, you know, you've, you've got to put those effort into, like, if you don't want to be a chef, you got to put the time in. If you want to be a cyclist, it takes a ton of time. If you want to be, uh, you know, I mean, any one of us could be an astrophysicist. It's really not that What was that segue? Where did that segue happen for you to find the bike? So how did I find the bike? So it goes back to my time in the hospital. And I had never watched the Tour de France, really. I'd seen segments of it, but you know, just the highlights on ESPN or something like that. I didn't have the patience to sit for hours of coverage. So when you're truly laid up in the hospital, the Tour de France is exceptional. Um, but then I, I learned about the dynamics of teamwork and how you work together and the uh, the grueling nature of it. I was just absolutely astounded. I also, I, my whole life, I'd always held triathletes to a high standard. Like, how could somebody do three sports in one day? Um, and so after my injury, I wanted to do triathlon because it's like I wanted to do something that I didn't think I could do. Instead, I did a uh, instead. So I ended, I signed up for a sprint distance triathlon, which means for here in the states, we had a small indoor uh, twenty five yard pool. And then, but even sorry to cut across you, Meg. Like that's even so oh. instructivist your mindset at the time because it's like what's you didn't like that word disabled. You didn't like that yeah. idea of a disability. Yeah. Like what's the total opposite end of that spectrum? Well, it's kind of doing a try for a normal Joe Soap, yeah. you know, obviously we can get into nuances and, you know, some purists will go, oh, well, you're kind of average at three sports, you're better off specializing in one. Oh, but yeah. for your average mm-hmm. Joe public, it's like yeah. oppositing to a disability is probably a triathlon. So it's right. so instructive into your mindset that you're like, well, this isn't going to limit me. This isn't the end of my story. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm shooting. That's totally what it was. So, I mean, I had to borrow a bike. I had never swam uh, a thousand yards. I'd never run 5K in this like new life of mine. Like, honestly, if I if the lanes had been big enough, I could have swam in circles. Because like when you, you, <laughs> when you swim, you have two flippers and I just had one. So I had to learn to swim a straight line. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, I swam and I was like, oh. All right. I did that check. And then I borrowed somebody's bike and I, I rode the, those 20 K and I was like, well, it wasn't so bad. And I didn't have a running leg at the time. I just had a normal walking leg and, and I tried to run with it. So I looked more like, this sounds not nice to old men, but like an old man shuffle or old lady shuffle. Like I, I ran as best as I could. And it, my goal was not to be last. I was seventh from last and there's nothing wrong with being last. Like the Moulin Rouge, like that, that is also a huge, there's nothing wrong with being last. When you finished up with Paris Sports, you know, you have a lot of gold medals sitting in your bedside locker and you have an amazing legacy that you've built through Paris Sport. For a lot of athletes, that kind of feels like, okay, story complete, chapter closed on my mm-hmm. athletic career. And the story arc is, it's it's a very nice story arc from a, you know, sitting back, it's like promising tennis player, catastrophic, life-changing accident. You think she's down and out, but no, she's not. She's back and yeah. you have this amazing success as a para-athlete. And then it's chapter closed on that. But something doesn't quite let you finish up. Like where, where does that drive come from to now move across into gravel and to start pursuing these yeah. new objectives? So it kind of goes back to like the beginning. Like I didn't know what para sport was. I didn't know that I would, if I was impaired enough. I didn't know what qualified me. Like I didn't, like, I think a lot of us, when we were little kids, we see the Olympics go and we're like, oh man, I want to be an Olympian. And then all of a sudden you hit high school, college, university, and you're like, oh, that's not an option. So I didn't really know that I'd have the opportunity to race for Team USA. And once I learned um, that I had a qualifying physical impairment, I was like, well, shoot, what is this going to take? So I, I, I really dedicated myself because I'd always wanted to wear the stars and stripes. Once that chapter ended for me after the Rio games, um, I kind of took some time off, focused on my physical therapy career. And however, like riding bikes is hugely empowering. Um, like bikes, I like to think of them as they, they are a form of a wheelchair that we all use to go further and faster than we could on our two feet alone, whether that's to go to school, to work, to pick up things from the grocery store or to go off on a trail somewhere like, um, found bikes because, this is kind of going back to a question you had before. So I was paired with a service dog. Her name was Betsy, the wonder dog, um, because there was a time where I was told I would never walk again. Actually, I had this story arc of like comes back, races triathlon, and then is told she'll never walk again. So I was using crutches and wondering what my life would be like. Got Betsy so she could pick up things I dropped, pulled my wheelchair. Then clearly I got a leg again. And so then I was like, oh man, Betsy's still a dog. Like I want to play with my dog. So I would go, I couldn't walk on trails far enough. I couldn't 
run with her. I couldn't walk even on a flat surface to tire out my young border collie healer. So I was like, oh, I saw people mountain biking with their dogs. Maybe I'll do that. I was too self-conscious to ride with other people, but my dog doesn't care how fast or how (laughs) slow I am. Dogs are the greatest. Uh, However, Betsy, again, being a little cow dog, herding dog, she is fit. So she would have to wait for me. And I wanted to be as fit as my dog. So that was really the impetus to get into cycling was to be able to play with my dog. And then I met people on the trail. I did Xterra off-road triathlon. I was the first female um, challenge athlete to ever do Xterra off-road triathlon. And then from there, I was like, oh man, I did 24-hour races. And then from there, I met the, somebody who knew somebody on the national team and they invited me down to California for a development camp. And then from there, that just kind of snowballed. They're like, oh wow, you're a really good mountain biker. Now can you ride on the road? You're going to have to hang up your mountain bike. And that was, I was hard for me to do is hang up my mountain bike for a while and really focus on the road. I had a great career on the road and um, Betsy was there for all of it. I blame everything good on my dog actually <laughs> and when that dog? career uh, i actually have a new dog his name is pax betsy had to stop being yeah. betsy and now pax is my new trail buddy and i love i mean dogs are amazing what they can learn to do like like she that betsy the wonder dog she's she changed my life so if you like this video you should definitely check out this video because i know you're gonna love it and don't forget to subscribe to the channel